Okay, we're going to finish up class 42 today. We're going to finish up class 42 today. We're in the last section of it on the back of your handout for 42. Shh. Talking about perpendicular Gothic. So this is the last period, uh, the last main movement of English Gothic. <clears throat> and so this is right towards the end, 1350 to 1520. Um, so first we're going to look at characteristics. This is definitely more emphasized on vertical lines. The structures are still fairly, fairly wide, but there's this movement to kind of match more of the French Gothic style of, of getting more, more verticality. We have what's called perpendicular linearity, so basically straight up lines, right? Vertical lines. We're going to see this, and it's really obvious when we look at the windows. And we're going to look at this picture again. Uh, but this is the nave. This is the, the huge window right behind the main altar in Glou Gloucester it's Cathedral. This is for the choir. So most choirs for clerics are, are set up like this. Oh, so the pews are behind that. Right, exactly. Jeez, that's really far. It's huge. OK. Um, we're also going to see, um, in some cathedrals, we're going to see two different styles of roofs start to come about. Wait, is that the altar, Mr. Lincoln? Uh-huh. So, can I have something from it? the pews. Uh, we're also going to see Whoa. this development yeah. of what's called hammer beam, hammer beam roofs. So, really, so really so thick, really thick so uh, roofs. Uh, this is a library. So this is a library in a college. What's with, what's with the cups and everything? It's like China. Uh, They're probably using it as a retreat. Maybe it's also a, maybe it's also a dining hall. But this is um, one of the rooms of a library of King's College, which is one of the older colleges of, of England. But you can see go here the, again, those, those hammer beam roofs, those really thick beams of, of the roofs. Shh. Yes? Uh huh. Yep. Yep. We're also going to see the chancel, right? So it's a smaller, smaller side chapel, but it's also used for saying divine office, etc. And you can see this, these hammer beam roofs here. What are the that like decorated wall thing? That's all stone. That's all stone carving. Oregon. All throughout. Another thing that we're going to see in roofs, if we're not doing hammer beam roofs, we're doing what's called fan vaulting. Jeez, oh my that's so cool. Goodness, that's sure. crazy. So actually, this isn't the nave. Sorry, this is a um, this is a cloister. So fan vaults, it's this, right? So the the pillar goes up, the the pier goes up, and it's spreading out the weight in that fan shape. And so this is really a development that we're going to see mostly in England. So, in some cases, it's going to move back down into the mainland of Europe, uh, but it really is more of an English invention. And this is continuing on some of those really ultra-decorated roofs, uh, ceilings that we've seen in some of the earlier cathedrals as well. Uh, but during the perpendicular Gothic, those fan vaults are really going to explode. And we see it again, King's College Choir. So the chapel of King's Co College, all these fan vaults, this fan vaulting. King College. Well, they have they have a library, they have a choir, they have a chancel. There's. I like the black. It's really cool. Yeah. Is the choir like separate from the? It's too dark. Yeah. There's that screen in front of the altar. Oh, so how does it get? Yeah, how does it get to the altar? It's a state. Because it's, uh, it's the organ. The organ's right between, so it's, it's like, going all throughout the church. Yeah. Wasn't the the gold pipes? Is that an organ pipes? Yeah. Those are pipes. Those are bronze organ pipes. What's that? Yeah, they clean it a lot. Yeah. This is the vestibule of another church, Christ Church, in London. It's called Christ Church. Christ Church. Um, so you're going to see, again, all that fan vaulting throughout. How long would it take to do that soon? Probably a long time. <laughs> all, right. all right, so we're going to look at one main cathedral in the perpendicular style. This is Gloucester Cathedral. 
Um, it's not Gloucester. It's Gloucester. I don't know. It's kind of like Worcester, Worcestershire. It's, it's Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Sometimes also called Wash Your Sister. That's what I call it. I don't know. You guys are weird if you don't call it that. Okay. Um, there's a lot of fire. There's a lot of fires. There was a there was a big fire, and so this rebuilding of this cathedral took quite a long time. Um, took 170 years. So following a fire in 1222, there was an ambitious uh, building program. This is the east window that we saw. When it was installed, it was the largest window in the world. And again, we, we do see some images of the saints in there, um, but a lot of it is quite decorative. We're going to see more of the just the clear glass or, I mentioned this before, the grizel, the, the gray glass um, that was seen in some of the other cathedrals. What yeah? is this? this is in England. This is all so England. Now it's, uh, England. Uh huh. So the saints are all there, but it's not. Yeah. Mr. Now, Mr. Anglicans did Mr. not have as much of a as much of a hatred as the saints as some of the mainland Protestants oh. did. Yes. So, Mr. Yes. Oh, uh, when it says spans many styles, what does that mean? So there were. It spans different styles of the English Gothic. So it was the early and then perpendicular. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. This is probably up there just because it's so big. As we move forward through Gloucester Cathedral, again, you see all this woodworking. This section of it is very much early Gothic, but because it was constructed, this part of the church was constructed during the early Gothic period. Um, this is, I think the, so the, I think the altar is here. Yeah. So the faithful will be sitting here, and then the big window that we've been seeing is up here. So like, they can't even see the mass. Right. 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 That was pretty common in the 1200s, that there would be this, there, there would be this screen. Remember, I think we've talked about this before, so how in, in very early periods, there was this, and again, this goes back to the Jewish Temple of Jerusalem, where there's the Holy of Holy, right? There's this, uh, there's this veil between, um, you know, the most important part and, and the people. Um, in the Eastern Orthodox, there's still these, this wall, basically, separating the sanctuary. Um, during the 1400s, 1500s, most of that was done away with, but some churches still have it. So the Great East Window was that big uh, stained glass. Window, yep, right? and it was up there. But like, that's kind of normal because like, you can't see the mask. Doesn't like, convents and that kind of do that? Some of them do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the um, arcades. This is one of the, the cloisters of Gloucester Cathedral. It was also monastic. There was an order of monks that was living there. And you see the fan vaulting. You see the... The decorative stonework. Uh huh. What's the, is, that, is that these those black stones in the ground? Are those on purpose? Like, they look how weird. Not sure what those are for. Yeah, I don't know. Here's another view of the cloisters, and again with that really intricate fan vaulting and ceiling. Here's an exterior. Now, if this looks familiar. It's because it is. Harry Potter. I was about to say that. Yep. Wait. I was going to say it does actually look very. Yep. Actually, no. So they did. They did a lot of scenes in a lot of different older buildings, a lot of different cathedrals, a lot of different uh, monasteries. But some of those scenes were done here in Gloucester Cathedral. Is that appropriate? It's. It, that's. It's not really a working monastery anymore, so it's okay. Right. So that that would be okay as long as they re remove the Blessed Sacrament first, okay. generally speaking, as long as the movie isn't totally profane or something. Okay. okay. So that is that class. Now let's move on to class forty-three.
All right, now we're going to look at <clears throat> this kind of intermediary period between the late Gothic and then moving on into the Renaissance. Unlike, unlike a lot of other art movements where we've seen a clear-cut line between Romanesque and Gothic, between um, you know, classical and Romanesque, there's not as much of a, smooth or a, a break between these two different periods. Um, it happened pretty gradually, and it happened over a, a period of years. So here's your refined or revised timeline. We've got rid of all the medieval stuff up there. So this is the same pink that we've seen before. So early Gothic, high Gothic, late Gothic. Obviously, English Gothic is all throughout here as well. This is what we're going to be looking at here, this transitional period. It goes between the mid-1200s and the late 1300s. As you can see, this transitional period is going to overlap here because a lot of the Gothic is happening still in England. A lot of it is happening still in certain parts of Italy up until 1500. So transitional period is happening in certain places and at certain times through the mid-1200s to the late 1300s. And again, as you can see, it overlaps here again. So Florence is going to be the first one to really kick off the Renaissance. There's still this transitional period. Some Gothic is still happening. So it's kind of, it's, it's not as much of a clean break. The Renaissance is more like that type? Uh, no, Renaissance is more uh, kind of that humanist art. Uh, we'll, we'll start to dive into that a little bit. The Renaissance Festival, so is this during that period? What's that? The Renaissance Festival? <laughs> yeah, they, it's not usually perfectly accurate. Sometimes we're going to go into like Gothic and medieval. It's just kind of old timey time period. Okay, so this is roughly what we're talking about, this transitional period here. Um, during the Gothic period, we haven't talked much about so two-dimensional art. We've been looking at a lot of architecture. We've been looking at some sculpture. Uh, but I wanted to bring up manuscripts. Um, the reason why we haven't talked about them much is because there's not a lot of development artistically in manuscript uh, ar artistry. Uh, this is one example. This is called the Bible of St. Louis. It's also called it has like four different names. Uh, it's called a Bible Moralese, which is basically a moral Bible. It's meant to be a teaching Bible. So they're going to have the text of the Bible, but they're also going to have pictures next to certain passages or a lot of the passages to kind of help to uh, educate the people as they're reading the Bible. Why did we not talk about painting during like the medieval Roman Gothic? Was that like a thing? It just wasn't as much. The, the, the painting, so we saw some manuscripts, but painting just didn't exist as much. Um, the main sort of two-dimensional art that we've seen has been manuscripts. So we saw some manuscripts earlier, um, but... So like, was the most advancement in architecture throughout this whole mm -hmm. wall here in medieval Gothic and Romanesque, would you say? Uh, yeah, Romanesque, Gothic, some medieval, and then definitely into the Renaissance, yeah. Wait, so St. Louis is King Louis? Mm -hmm. oh. So these were produced... Three volumes produced between 1226 and 1234 at the request of his mother. If you look at it, it's very medieval. It's very, you know, medieval yeah. Romanesque style. And again, we're in, now in that transitional period. It hasn't really advanced much. Um, there's going to be, it's going to be a little bit better. Um, the, the background is all gold leaf or something? Yeah, it's all gold leaf. And then these are certain passages from scripture, and then there's a picture on each. So this is, it's a very large book because it's not just text. There's a lot of pictures. That's why it's called a Moralese Bible. It's, it's teaching with art as well as with, as well as with text. But if you, look at the, if you look at the depictions, it's very flat. It's very medieval, right? So we're not going to see a lot of advancement in two-dimensional art until we get towards that kind of later end of the transitional period and starting to get into the Renaissance. We've also seen that there's not a lot of freestanding sculpture. All the sculpture that we've seen has been aspects of or parts of architecture. So carvings in architecture. There's not a lot of freestanding sculpture. <coughs> there were some. They were produced. They were mostly devotional statues. You know, things like it about the size of the statues that we have over there on the on the table. Um, but what ha and, and there would be statues on altars and things like that. Um, but again, not a lot of development during the Gothic period. It was, that's why we haven't talked about it much, because it's, um, 
it's just really medieval Romanesque style. Um, also, these freestanding sculptures, especially ones this size, they get broken easily. They're transported around a lot, so they get broken. Um, also, during the Protestant Reformation, a lot of statues destroyed. So we don't have a lot of good examples of Gothic sculpture, Gothic freestanding sculpture. And even showing you this is kind of a cheat because this is a this is a freestanding sculpture, but it's a pulpit within a church, so it's kind of architectural. Wait, so the priest would stand up on top of that. that yeah, really up in there. How do you get up there? Um, there's some stairs back here yeah. that you, there's some stairs back here that you can't see. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to be looking at two pulpits, and we're going to. This is really going to. Again, like I said before, art historians love seeing a progression in style over a short period of time. Um, so this is a pulpit. This is done in the Pisa Cathedral. Uh, the artist's name, the sculptor's name was Nicola Pisano, which means of Pisa, right? So his family name was, he's Nicola from Pisa, basically. Um, he was an extraordinary sculptor. This was done 1265, 1268. This was done over three, three, year, three years. And as we look through it, it's very much a, that's just the lighting. It's very much in Roman style. It looks, if you think back to some of the Roman sarcophagi that we saw, it's very, very similar to that. Um, again, sculpture hasn't, especially in freestanding stuff, hasn't developed as much. But we're not seeing, but it is interesting, during this period, it is a development of sorts because it's not those really long, elongated figures that we saw on the doorways of Chartres, for instance, on the archways of Chartres. He's, Nicola is going back to the early Roman style. And this is, and we're going to start to see this movement happen as we move into the Renaissance. Artists are going to want to go back to the classical periods. They're going to see that this is a great style. This is a great way of, of depicting uh, people and scenes. And so they're going to want to kind of reach back and, all right, what are they doing? Let's, let's reinvestigate that. Let's redo that. So it's very Roman in style. It's also very Gothic in style. You see the, uh, the tri trefoil pattern, right? That three archway pattern, that's very Gothic in style. As we zoom in, looks very, very Roman. And we're gonna look at this again and we're gonna compare it to another one here in a second. But this could be Roman. If you didn't know any better, you put this, in, and if I told you this is Roman, you would absolutely think it is. Mm -hmm. Is it like tying a religious story? Yeah, so this is this is a whole scene. It's it's kind of done it's kind of done in, in some in a weird um, style. So this is showing the Annunciation. This is showing the birth of Christ. This is showing presentation in the temple. They're kind of using artistic license. He's kind of using artistic license here and showing Jesus being baptized, even though he wasn't baptized in the presentation. So it's kind of a narrative scene showing three different events at the same time. So this is after she's given birth to our Lord and our Lord's here. And one of the heads of the shepherds is gone. How did she, well, the baby, and Jesus. Jesus' head is gone. No, he's here. Not in the bottom of the bathroom. Oh, right. Um, I don't think this was because of the Protestant Reformation because that didn't really hit Italy. I think that was just damage. I think that was just over time. Uh, the evangelist. Yeah, I both say that. So it's it's a it's a it's a, a symbol of the evangelist. So when the priest is, is preaching, he's preaching of the evangelists. Okay. So this was Nicola Pisano. He very Roman style, really good technique though. But then forty years later, his son Giovanni, who trained with his father Nicola. His son Giovanni uh, was also a sculptor, learned under his father, uh, and 40 years later got a couple commissions of his own. Um, this is in a town called Pistoia. He basically said, my dad did a pulpit, I'm gonna do a pulpit, and I'm gonna do it better. And he did. It's extraordinary. And we're gonna do some more comparing and contrasting of this. So how do you get up from that one? Um, this, yeah, so this one's not used anymore. This is now just seen as kind of an art piece. So 
let's look at some of the let's look at some of the sculptors sculptures. It's a lot. It's yeah. It's a lot more high relief, right? There's spaces now in between. So instead of this, the figures being kind of medium relief or low relief back up against the background, he's going to be carving back in and out, and he's going to making going to be making kind of this undulating kind of swirling patterns of people. And just like the other pulpit, there's eight sides to it, so there's eight scenes. Um, this but is the same one as last. This is this is Giovanni, so this is his son. But it's the so same scene, it. right? Same. Two of the scenes are the same. Other ones are different. Isn't that beautiful? Look at this. What's going on here? That's the, the same, same thing. thing. The same thing. The, the guy on the side. Same thing. Oh, the annunciation, the, the birth, presentation. It's kind of trippy if you like, don't focus on the Is that a monkey? Closely. On the left? Yes. That's kind of tripping because like, all these like, figures are small. A monkey? Mm -hmm. Where? Oh, oh, the other side. Oh, my God. You're both on the right? Holy shit. We also see depictions of the Last Judgment on this one. And again, there's this swirling. There's, there's a lot of dynamism. What? The crown on his head. That might be Moses, I think, actually. So this is a depiction of the Last, last Judgment. And again, you can absolutely see how, how the art has progressed over time. This is another, this is another view with just some more detail of... Of um of that same scene. What's the one on the? See at the top right, like there's a tree and the guy with no head and the angel. Yeah, I'm not sure what that one is. Maybe it's the uh him talking Adam to Shepherd. Eve. It's probably Adam and Eve. No, maybe. Or, or maybe it's Adam and Eve. It's like the angel talking to Shepherd. Adam and Eve. What's his name? All right, so let's compare the two. Um, let's compare the two of of the pulpits we have two scenes that are the same so this is um this is nicola this is the dad in pisa and this is his son in uh trieste That's insane. right so again 40 year period big difference in style this is showing how quickly the artist uh, the art artistry is progressing during this during this transitional period Crucifixion panel. This is Nicola. This is the father. Still really good. Still very well done. But then we see Giovanni. I think it looks more real. Yeah, it's more real. It's more. Natural. Yeah, it's more natural. There's a lot more, a lot more to it. Okay. That's Giovanni. Uh, yeah, this is Giovanni. Everything's just more like. There's more motion. Uh huh. Everything's more emotion. Like, more motion. Deep. It's cut deeper. It's more high relief. Yeah. All right, we also have, during this period, a kind of a sub-style. It's called the Italo-Byzantine style. Uh, and again, they're, they're saying, well, there's a lot of great culture. There's a lot of uh, tradition in the Byzantine style. And remember how we talked about some Byzantine artists had come over into, into Italy to escape uh, uh, the, the iconoclastic movement. And so they're going to be training a lot of artists. And so this is happening mostly in Italy. This is called, again, the Italo-Byzantine style. Altarpieces are going to be moving away from this medieval style. They're going to move more towards a Byzantine style. Um, but they're going to be adding some, some differences. This is the St. Francis altarpiece. It's still very flat, similar to what we've seen with some of the other Byzantine styles. But they're going to be adding more to it. So let's zoom in a little bit here up on the top. And we can see... Most Byzantine icons are just going to have one saint, one figure, maybe some angels, maybe some of the wording. But in the Italo-Byzantine style, they're also going to add other scenes throughout. So they're going to make it more, more interesting. So to tell more of the stories of, in this case, the life of St. Francis as he's moving along. A what? This guy? He's yeah. saying, does he have a beard? Oh, yeah, he has a beard. Hey, Michelle, I'm sorry. Hey, how can you know? That looks like cheekbones. I don't know. Maybe it's just like it's artistic. So very stretched, very elongated, very Byzantine. But again, 
the additions of, of other scenes throughout. All right, so as we start to move into the Renaissance, let's look at, let's just do a quick recap of what we've been seeing, okay? Uh, so there's no slides for this section real quick for these, for these two, two figures, but what was happening with the figure first? In ancient Greece and Rome, artists embraced the realities of the human body and the way that our bodies move in space, this naturalism, right? We saw that with, with Roman sculpture, with Greek sculpture. They were very much interested in depicting the human form as it was, right? Yes. because it wasn't as important to them to depict things as naturally. So that's your next bullet point, actually. So in ancient Greece and Rome, artists embraced the realities of the human body and the way that our bodies move in space. Naturalism, right? Let's make things look realistic, natural, emotion, etc. right? Ancient Rome, ancient Greece, we can see that. But for the next thousand years after Europe transitioned from a pagan culture to a Christian one, the physical characteristics, trying to depict things naturally, realistically, was ignored. So to Tony's question, why? Because they saw sculpture as not necessarily needing to uh, depict the human form perfectly. What's the purpose of sculpture, especially liturgical sculpture? It's to draw our eye to God, is to make us think of heavenly things. And so we don't need necessarily to make the human body look perfect when we're sculpting someone. We just need to get across the idea, and we need to get across the idea of saints uh, and, and God himself. So it's just not necessary. That's why Byzantine icons are not very naturalistic looking. It's not meant to look naturalistic. That was never their intent. Their intent was to give, it, give us an, uh, an object with which to use for our devotion. Medieval human figures were still rendered well, but they were elongated, flattened, and static. In other words, they were meant to function symbolically, right? So classical art was meant to be realistic. Early medieval, they kind of ignored all that. Byzantine definitely ignored all that. And then as we get into uh, Romanesque, Gothic, okay, we're going to start to increase some naturalism a little bit more, but even still, we're not going to try to go all the way back to the classical during this transitional period and then into the Renaissance especially, we're going to see this kind of recapturing of the classical period. That's what the Renaissance means, renaissance, rebirth. And so the Renaissance artists consider themselves the, that they were rebirthing the classical period all over again. Okay, so that's why we're not going to see these natural, uh, these natural depictions. In space, right, in the composition of a work, how do, we see, how do we see that? Instead of earthly seed, s settings, right, we often see gold backgrounds. The saints are depicted in front of a gold background. We're not going to depict the saints in uh, natural space. We're not going to depict the saints in walking down a path or sitting in a house. They're saints. Where are they? They're in heaven. So we're going to paint them with a gold background because they're in heaven. Right, exactly. So we're not going to depict saints naturally. We're going to see a rebirth, a renaissance of that as we move into the renaissance. What are they supposed to be holding? Yeah, why they came up in? What are swords? Uh, so... Are they supposed to be like reeds or something? Uh, uh, they're like three people carrying knives. I'm not sure what this one is, actually. I don't know specifically. So artists begin during this time to re-explore the physical realities of the human figure in space. They're beginning the long process of figuring out how space can be a rational, rational, measurable environment in which their newly naturalistic figures can sit, can stand, and can move. All right, so Florence and Siena. In Italy, during this, during this time period, there's two city-states that are the most important. Milan was important. Venice was important. We've already seen how Venice was important, but they were more important during uh, kind of the Byzantine Romanesque period. 
Um, Rome, not very important during this time period. They're going to become more important later on in the Renaissance. Um, but during this transitional period, 1200s to 1300s, Siena and Florence, those are the two main powers in Italy. And this is where a lot of the artistic representations are going to start to uh, really develop a lot more quickly. The primary artists in Siena were Duccio. We have the Lorenz, Lorenz, uh, Lorenzetti brothers. We have Simone Martini. This is Simone Martini. And so it's still sort of Byzantine. It's still sort of Gothic. We still have kind of a plain background, but now we have this canopy here. Now we have the figures in space. Instead of them all being just kind of flat and just standing in a line, now they're more in kind of an actual um, layers. layers. Yeah, layers of, of people. And you wouldn't have seen this during Byzantine, during the Gothic period. Um, we see landscapes. We see architecture in their paintings, although these are often represented schematically. So again, Simone Martini, still on a gold background, but we're going to see a Why little bit more. Angry? Huh? Martini always did his figures that way. I don't know. Um, so we still see this gold background because this is a holy event, right? The Annunciation. But you see her sitting in a chair. Instead of just standing straight, she's sitting in a chair, more three-dimensional. We see the angel speaking to her, still pretty flat, but and this part is cut off, but you see some vases of flowers spread throughout. Is there a reason why he didn't like this? Because she seems like super disappointing. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you also see an angel floating up here in the background. So we're starting to see, again, these little, little bits, these little bits of naturalism starting to creep into artwork during this transitional period. Um, if we look closely, we can often see, again, here, that this space and this space would be almost impossible to move through. The perspective is not good. It doesn't really make sense from a three-dimensional standpoint. Um, and the scale of the architecture really doesn't match the figures. And we're going to see this for the next about 100 years or so. All right, so let's move into Duccio. Duccio was, we're going to look at Florentine artists in a little bit. Next period, we're going to look at, at Florentine artists in this transitional period in Florence, because this is really when, it, when it's going to start to kick off. But there was um, art that was happening in Siena at the time. And one of the first main artists of what's called the Sienese School, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later as well. His name was Duccio. His full name was Duccio di Buoninsegna. He was one of the greatest Italian painters in the Middle Ages and, like I said, the founder of the Sienese School. He was trained under these Italo-Byzantine artists, and so that's where his first artworks really started to kick off. So we see this, these panels. This is called the Crucifixion Triptych. Okay. So the middle panel is still very Byzantine, except we have a little bit of landscape here. In this depiction of St. Francis with his vision, we start to see some landscape here. What's with the red? Is that like a witch color? Uh, so this is showing the, the power of God. This is what's called a mandorla. Basically, it's a super big halo surrounding, surrounding our Lord. And these artists during this time are really going to start to investigate with diagonal lines first time we're going to see diagonal lines in paintings. And we're going to see that a lot more with Giotto as we move forward as well. We see our Lord and Our Lady in, in a throne. Again, perspective is, is off. It doesn't make sense, right? These lines are going this way when in reality they should be coming straight at us, etc. Yeah. Have, have they just not figured it out yet, the perspective, or are they just not put it for itself? Both. They didn't put the effort into really trying at this point, because again, it wasn't important. We're not trying to show something that's really realistic. Duccio is starting a little bit, but he's not really, again, he's, he's learning from the Byzantine style. So he doesn't really have that, there's not that, a lot of that importance. Same thing here with the Annunciation, same thing here with Our Lady Enthroned with the Child Jesus. Again, perspective is off, but at least they're starting to show some, some characteristics of, of, um, of space. Uh, Duccio began over time, though, to break down the sharp lines of Byzantine art, and he began to soften the figures. So what do I mean by softening the figures? He's adding shading. So instead of things being absolutely flat, we can see here in the depiction of St. Francis, there's a lot of shading. There's, there's 
some mass to his body. Instead of just being flat and two-dimensional, there's some mass here, right? Same thing here, same thing here, right? And he's using some of this gold gilt lines in order to kind of help with that. Again, still in the Byzantine style, but he's starting to add more weight and, and some more depth. He started using modeling, playing with light and dark colors to reveal the figures underneath the heavy drapery. Hands, faces, you know, parts of the body became, became more rounded and three-dimensional. If you look at the body of Christ, right, we have the shadowing on the side and under the arms and on the legs, again, showing that three-dimensionality. Um, here's another example. Uh, the child Jesus in disputation with the doctors. So the doctor's sitting here and Joseph and Mary and they're finally finding him. There's a lot of detail in this, right? Very kind of Roman in style. Perspective is still way off. It doesn't really make sense. The ground almost looks like it's sloping way down. Again, perspective is off. Um, but they're starting to kind of give you this idea of figures existing in space where that wasn't happening before. Um, and he was one of the first ones to really try to organize his figures purposefully in space. Again, ground doesn't really make sense. This perspective here is pretty good, yeah. but this actually should be kind of coming down here. And these guys are too big compared to the woman at the well and compared to Jesus. We have the rock outcropping. That's a diagonal line, diagonal lines. Lots of diagonal lines starting to happen here, right, to show perspective and to show space. Still not done very well, but it's, it's starting. He's trying. Um, but even though this is one of his later works, it still has that. He still keeps going back to that Byzantine style, right, especially for altarpieces, especially for works that are meant to be in a church. So Our Lady Enthroned with the Child Jesus right? The angels are just kind of floating in space. They're not really set in a naturalistic, realistic way. Again, perspective, not great. We have that gold background, very Byzantine. Um, but the figures are a little more rounded or a little more three-dimensional. But he has a lot of detail, a lot of detail in the drapery that we wouldn't have seen with Byzantine art. We see a lot of depth to, to Our Lady. Not a lot of shading, but some of it. We have the we have the stars on her garment. Again, very Byzantine. Um, so it's just kind of this, it's this interesting mix of Byzantine and Gothic, and then kind of giving us a kind of sneak peek into what uh, Byzantine or what the Renaissance is going to be looking like a little bit later. And then finally, this is one of his later, later works. Wow. It's in pretty poor shape. It wasn't originally green. Um, he tried to use copper to show the, to show the halos. That's why it's turned green now. Uh, so instead of gold leaf, but again, this is really where we're going to see a lot of really good modeling and a lot of really good uh, spacing, yeah, right? Really pretty. The garment down here, not very realistic, but you can see that that's, that's her right. knee there, right? Because it's, it's shaded better. This is the back. This is, you know, this is her chest area, but then her arm is moving forward into space, right? And so he's starting to really start to try to make things look more three-dimensional and, and, and modeled. This is, this is the Maesta, right? This is the Maesta. And again, more detail here. Yeah, that was very popular. Um, they were usually commissioned, right? Artists were not just making paintings just to make paintings and then to try to sell them like artists do today. Um, if you were a good artist and you were working in a good workshop and then you went on, uh, on your own, people would hire you. I want you to do this. A few months, maybe. Yeah, that's that's still kind of that Byzantine aesthetic. He's experimenting. He's he's really trying out a lot of different things. Yeah, basically. Um, wow, we finished way early. All right, so that's Siena. That's that's the, that's the city of Siena, and that's Duccio. Duccio was one of the greatest artists in this CNE style, and again, starting the CNE school. Hey, Mr. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, so uh, if the altar is here, and then there's this panel in the front. 
All right, next class we're going to go down to Florence and we're going to look at the transitional period in Florence. And we're going to see. Oh, thank you. Um, and we're going to see what was happening. We're going to see what was happening in Florence during this transition. Shh. We're going to see what was happening in Florence during this transitional period. Uh, this picture is. This painting is a painting on a wood panel. This was done by Chimabui. Um, I don't think we're going to talk about it next class because it's not really it's not really that important. Um, it's really dark um, because <laughs> it was hanging above a woman's stove in Italy for about 50 years, and she died. This is about two years ago. And her grandkids came and saw it and went, let's get this appraised. And they took it to an art dealer, and the art dealer immediately took it to the Royal Academy of Art in Florence. And they said, uh, this is an original Chimabui from the 1200s. Uh, how did your grandmother get this? I have no idea. So yeah, now it's worth uh, yeah, probably close to a million. So yeah, if your grandma dies and she has a painting above her stove, maybe, maybe go take a look at it. But, this was, you know, a seven-year-old, seven-hundred-year-old painting that was sitting there, and you never know. So, yeah, but they're going to be able to restore it. They haven't started restoring it yet, but they'll be able to restore it and, and bring back a lot of the color to it. Um, yeah. So we're still discovering a lot of these paintings that are just kind of hidden, all throughout. I don't think she knew. I think she probably just got it from an antique store or something. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. 